All right. Well, this is awesome to see all of you here. When I uh, was asked to come and give a talk today, and I proposed something about bats, because there's a lot of very interesting things going on in the bat world right now, you're never quite sure who's going to show up. You might get one person, you might get 100 people. Because bats are kind of one of these species that is a love-hate relationship with these animals. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about these animals. I can remember when I was a kid that my grandmother would come home, uh, she'd walk home from the, the beauty salon, and she would tell me, well, bats were uh, surrounding my head because of all the stuff they sprayed on my hair. Well, it wasn't until I got a little bit older and became a wild biologist that I realized my grandmother was bat guano crazy and didn't really fully understand it wasn't bats, for one thing, and it wasn't around her hair. So we're going to talk about bats as we wander our way through this next hour. Um, and there's a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of things going on with bats right now, especially the northern long-eared bats. We'll focus a lot of the, the uh, presentation on that as well. But we'll also give you kind of a, a bigger, broader view of bats so that hopefully you'll leave here with a little bit more knowledge than you came and a better understanding about what's going on with uh, the long-eared bat and the Endangered Species Act from the perspective of a forced landowner. All right. So with that being said, uh, my name is David Drake, and I'm an Extension Wildlife Specialist and an Associate Professor in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at UW-Madison, and I'm actually on the wildlife side. Uh, I don't know what the heck my forestry colleagues are doing, and I don't really care what they're doing too much, but so I'm on the good side of the department, on the wildlife side of the department, okay? All right. Um, okay, so bats, uh, bats, I think, are just absolutely fascinating animals for a whole variety of reasons, but th the first thing is they are the only true flying mammal we have in the world. And so we think about uh, flying squirrels, we call them flying squirrels, and, and in this part of the uh, country we've got northern and southern flying squirrels. Southern flying squirrels are the much more common of the two flying squirrel species, but they don't tr are, are not true flying mammals. They will get up on an elevated perch and then jump off and open up their, uh, their legs. And they've got this tag of skin, and so they glide, but they don't actually fly. But bats actually do fly, but they're able to flap their wings and fly, and that's pretty interesting in and of itself that they can do that. But bats also, we've got a, a, quite a bit of diversity of bats worldwide. We've got over 1,200 bat species worldwide. We've got a pretty decent amount of bats in the United States. Most of these bats in the United States are uh, a good amount of them are uh, in the southwestern part of the United States. So we're lucky to have the amount of bat diversity we have here in Wisconsin. And we'll talk a little bit more about why we don't have more diversity of bats and a greater uh, number of species. But just look at some of these bats. I and mean, these are pretty interesting looking animals. So this is a Townsend big-eared bat right there. And uh, they call it big-eared, obviously, because it's got big ears. But uh, these, uh, the other thing about bats, obviously, is they can echolocate. So they'll send out sound waves. And then that sound wave will push off of something that is in front of that bat. And then the sound wave will come back to the animal. And so they'll uh, be able to echolocate using those sound waves, but they also use these ears, and all bats have external, relatively large ears compared to the proportional size of their head, so they use these ears uh, for listening as well. Now this is a Townsend big ear bat, this is a Jamaican fruiting bat, that's kind of interesting looking at the animal. How'd you like to have that thing coming at you uh, at night? And then this is a Mexican long tongue bat, so um, I'm guessing it's got a longer tongue than the uh, short tongue bat. But it's always interesting how we name these animals. And then within Wisconsin, that we've had historically eight bat species here, but we uh, currently have just seven bat species now. The eighth is the Indiana, uh, Indiana bat, which is a federally endangered species. And it, it historically, its range did push up into the very southern part of, of Wisconsin. So where we are now, historically, the Indiana bat would have been found in this part of Wisconsin. Uh, but not any further north. And then the other issue about the, the uh, uh, Indiana bat is that it has not been recorded here in Wisconsin since the early 1960s. So for all extents and purposes, it is an extirpated species of bat, even though it is still uh, active uh, into uh, Illinois and Iowa and Indiana, and, and then as you go east as well. But for Wisconsin, that bat is no longer found here in Wisconsin. So we talk about, really, we've got seven species of bats, and then we, we um, Kind of group them a, a couple of different ways, but one of the ways we think about bats are as resident bats or migratory bats. And one of the reasons we don't have more than seven bat species, it's kind of amazing we've got even this many, is that we live a good distance above the freeze line. And bats are insectivores, so that's what they primarily eat, is insects. And if uh, obviously the insects are not out here in the winter, 
So at that point, once winter comes upon us, then bats have a choice, and evolutionarily they've made this choice obviously long, long ago, but their choice is either hightail it south and get the heck out of here, or uh, to hibernate. And so we've got four resident bat species, and these are what we call our hibernating bat species. So these animals are here year-round in our state, but during the winter time, winter months, we don't see them because they're, they're actually hibernating. And then uh, we've got a variety of what we call hibernating species of mammals across uh, Wisconsin. These are what we call true hibernators. So once they go into this torpor where they, they actually lower their, their uh, metabolism, they lower their respiratory rate, uh, and their heart rate, that they actually are in that torpid state or that, that true hibernatory state all winter long until they wake up. Uh, and they're going to start waking up here pretty soon. In the next uh, probably couple of weeks or so, they'll start waking up. Um, and that's opposed to, for example, a bear, which we, a lot of people think of bears as hibernators, and they are hibernatory species, but they're more of a restive hibern uh, hibernator, where the bear will actually wake up or could be awoken relatively easy uh, in the den. And then we've got things like chipmunks, which are also restive hibernators, and the chipmunks are hibernating below the ground in their burrow system, but they wake up every couple of weeks to go and eat the food stores they've got in the burrow system, then they go back to sleep for a couple of weeks. And, that occasionally, if we've got a nice warm sunny day in the winter, you might even see chipmunks up above the ground, even though they, they really are a, a, a version of a hibernatory species. But these animals, these four species, are truly hibern hi uh, hibernating species, where they go to bed, and they don't wake up until maybe four, five, six months later, or something like that. Um, and so our four species that we have here in Wisconsin, that are resident species, are the big brown bat and the little brown bat, and then we've got the northern long-eared bat, and that bat was just uh, reclassified, the long-eared bat, I don't know, three or four years ago. It used to be known as the northern myotis, uh, after the genus myotis, which uh, uh, is the genus of, of uh, these species here. And then we've got the eastern pipistrelle as well. And so um, these four species, again, they, don't, they do uh, short distance migration. Sometimes they might migrate over a couple hundred miles and, and move south and north a little bit in our state. But they really are state resident species, and then they uh, stay within our state. Um, and then all four of these species can uh, utilize a wide variety of habitat. So they're all associated with some uh, forest land, so deciduous, uh, primarily deciduous trees. Um, they also can utilize urban, suburban areas, and they also utilize kind of a, an open farmland. And so the species that we would typically see in cities, for example, are the big brown bat, and the little brown bat, and if you've got bats in your, in your house, in your attic, or in your barn, it's most likely the big brown bat species here, although little brown bats will also occupy uh, uh, buildings, as well as these two species, but not, not nearly as frequently or commonly as the big brown bat or the little brown bat species do. And so uh, these are really interesting animals uh, because of some of the things that, they, that they've got going on, and also their reproduction is really interesting. I'll talk more about that when we start focusing uh, specifically on the northern long-eared bat here. All right, so those are our four resident bat species. And then we've got three what we call migratory species. So these are, in my mind, these are the smarter of the bat species because they get the heck out of the cold winter and they go somewhere where it's nice and warm. And so these animals do migrate uh, good distances, you know, several hundred miles, maybe a thousand miles to go south. And for the most part, they're active year-round. Uh, they might go into a little bit of a torpid state in the southern states, and it gets cool for a couple of nights. But for the most part, they're active year-round. And we call these, uh, they're, a lot of times you hear them referred to as migratory tree roosting species. So these three species are not only migratory, but they're, they're really associated with trees, forested areas, and you'll find them roosting in trees much more uh, frequently than you'll find the resident species roosting in trees, although the resident species also will roost in trees. So, uh, here we've got the eastern red bat, and you can see why they call it the red bat, because of that very, very red coat. The hoary bat, again because of the coat, that kind of that hoary color to it. And then the silver-haired bat right here. Okay, so those are the seven species that we're dealing with in Wisconsin, and for the most part, uh, those are the species that you're dealing with in the neighboring states as well, with the exception of you might pick up a couple of additional bat species like the Indiana bat or something of that nature. And the Indiana bat, again, uh, is a federally endangered species. So if you are doing something uh, and that you know you've got an Indiana bass in your property, definitely consult the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and have them come out and advise you how to manage your property so you're not I mean, in conflict with the Endangered Species Act. <coughs> okay, so 
Uh, a couple of years ago in Wisconsin, our Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources reclassified our bats. There, there were generally no protections on these bats other than they were non-game species, and that was the protection they received. But because of white nose syndrome, which we'll, just talk, we'll start talking about here in just a minute, uh, and because of, of uh, the, the threat of white nose syndrome coming from the east coast, moving west and south, that it had not yet gotten to Wisconsin, although it was, it was marching its way to Wisconsin, the DNR was proactive and actually reclassified the bat so that our four resident bat species are now state threatened species. So they receive legal protection under that, uh, that classification. And the migratory bats are species of special concern, which means that there's a lot more monitoring going on for the migratory species than previous uh, when they did not have that species of special concern tag on them. And the reason is um, because of white nose syndrome. And so white nose syndrome is this insidious fungal disease that is attacking bat species, and it started out in the uh, East Coast. And so up here in Albany, New York, I think it was uh, the winter of 2006, I believe, or 2007, one of those two winters, uh, there were some uh, people who were out near Albany, and they've got a bunch of cage systems out there in upstate New York, and they found dead bats out in the middle of the winter at the cave base, at the mouth of the cave, and they also found them as they were spelunking in the cave. And so they contacted somebody and they started investigating and they determined that within this cave ecosystem there's this naturally occurring fungus yeah the fungus for, for whatever reason nobody's quite sure what upset the cave ecosystem or all of a sudden it's not something this fungus is not it's not a it's not a non-native fungus it's not something that was was in the cave system it's always been there but for some reason that ecosystem balance got upset and all of a sudden the fungus really started to react and started attacking these bats. And so up in Albany, New York, they started looking into this, and one of the things they found is that a lot of the bats in those cave systems had white fungus around their muzzle. And then they also had fungus down on their wings uh, as well. And so it looks like, I've got a picture in just a minute, but it looks like somebody took a, a bat and just dipped that bat's face in powdered sugar. And you'll see this white uh, fungus around there. And then what also happens is the fungus will move from the muzzle and it will start eating holes in the wing membrane. And so what happens with this is, a, is, is kind of a, a, a two-fold problem. So number one, when bats are migrating, or excuse me, when they're hibernating, they will fold their, their wings up like this, and their wings kind of keep them warm. It's like a blanket for them. So when they've got holes in their wings, they're losing that thermal cover. But the other issue is if they, if they do escape the white nose syndrome and they actually wake up from hi, uh, hibernation, that with the holes in their wings, it obviously impacts their flight. And if they can't fly that well, they can't catch insects, and they can't drink, and, and so that causes some serious uh, problems from hydration and a nutritional standpoint. But the other issue with white nose syndrome that seems to be occurring is that when the animals are attacked with white nose syndrome, this fungus, that it causes them to wake up uh, in, in mid-hibernation. And as I was mentioning, when they're in this torpid state and they've really severely reduced their, uh, their metabolism, it costs them quite a bit of energy to kind of get their metabolism back up where they can become active and start flying around. And so, number one, it, it uh, causes them to burn through a lot of energy that they've stored up to make it through the winter. And as they burn through that energy to get their metabolism back up to start being active, they don't have enough energy to get through the rest of their, their uh, hibernation period. And then the other issue is obviously when they wake up in the middle of the winter, they're disoriented, and so that's what caused them to fly out of the cave. And so sometimes you'll find them at the mouth of the cave in the midwinter, and they're dead down in the snow simply because they're disoriented. But they also get severely dehydrated. It's the dehydration that is uh, kills them as much as anything else. And so um, white nose syndrome was first found in Albany, and they weren't quite sure what it was. Um, the the uh, vet diagnostic lab out of New York typed the fungus, figured out what the fungus was. And then they started looking, and it was just started spreading. And, and so each different color is different years. So 2006, 2007, it was started here. Gray is 2007, 8. Red is 2014, 15. And so you can see the red, as this is in about maybe a you know eight eight uh, year period, this is spread halfway across the country, which is a pretty amazing uh, rate of spread for a disease. The other disease that we see spreading you know, this quickly was, uh, was uh, West Nile virus that also started out on the East Coast here. So um, Wisconsin has been really proactive, the DNR has been very, very proactive about trying to protect the bat species here in Wisconsin. 
And they did that, uh, again, as I was mentioning, they reclassified the bats to give them extra legal protection as a state threatened species. Um, they put some, you know, some voluntary, but some, some pretty uh, uh, explicit recommendations if you're, if you're a spelunker or a cave explorer, what to do to clean your equipment so you're not transferred from cave to cave because research has discovered that you can actually infect uh, a non-infected cave with white nose syndrome. You, you can transfer that fungus from an infected cave to a non-infected cave simply by, by uh, moving uh, through those cave systems as a spelunker, for example. So they've been very good about telling the, spel the spelunking community or the cave uh, exploring community what to do to clean their equipment so that they can stop the spread of this. But unfortunately what happened, we're in Grant County right now, the southwestern part of the state here. Uh, uh, last year, uh, in Grant County, in a cave, that they found white nose syndrome, and, and it was a positive identification. And the interesting thing about this is the DNR had been in this cave, uh, so let's see, last year it was, uh, we're in 2015, 2014. DNR was in this cave in, in December 2013, and they did not find any white nose syndrome in that cave, and they went back to that cave in March of 2014, and they found white nose syndrome in that cave. And so, over the span of about a three month period, that uh, somehow white nose syndrome got in there and they started finding dead bats. And so, um, what happens, we haven't, we haven't seen the extent of it in Wisconsin yet, but what's happened out here in the East Coast is some of those caves have had 100% bat death. And so, I mean, every single bat, and sometimes you can get hundreds of thousands of bats in these, in these hibernacula, in these caves and mine systems. Every single bat in some of these caves was found dead because of white nose syndrome. So it is an unbelievably insidious disease. And the other issue with bats is, unfortunately, we don't know a lot about them. So, so we, don't, uh, we don't know a ton about their demography. We don't know a lot about their population structure and things like that. And so bats are long-lived animals. And they can live you know, 20 years or so. But they only have one or two pups a year. So even though they're long-lived, they're really slow reproducers. They're really slow breeders. And so when you're knocking their population down so quickly with white nose syndrome, the reproduction is, is not keeping pace with the mortality. And so you're starting to see some of these bat populations decline. And we're going to talk more about the northern long-eared bat in just a minute. But out in some parts of the East Coast, uh, the northern long-eared bat, the population has declined by as much as 99%. And so that's why the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is so concerned about the northern long-eared bat in particular. Uh, it is affecting other you know, resident, hibernatory, cave-dwelling bat species as well. But it doesn't seem to be affecting them as quickly as it's affecting the northern long-eared bat. Any questions about any of this? There's going to be a pop quiz, so I hope you guys are taking notes. What kind of temperature do they hibernate to? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So what kind of temperatures do they hibernate to? So typically the bat system, uh, the, I'm sorry, the cave systems are roughly about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, high humidity, and very low air current. And so it's really moist in there. And as a matter of fact, when you go into some of these caves, uh, the bats that are hibern hibernating actually will have you know, water droplets on their uh, pellage because it's so moist in that cave system. Um, you said that the fungus is naturally occurring, but that's only recently about yep. any speculation about why that is. No, the question is, I, I, he was just uh, re, uh, uh, kind of reaffirming that I mentioned that the fungus is naturally occurring, but it, it has not really caused any problems until 2006. Uh, so to my knowledge, nobody's aware of that. And the problem with white nose syndrome right now is science can't keep up with how fast this is moving along. And um, they were doing some typing of the fungus here, and they were looking at the, the fungus, uh, a similar type fungus that is in Europe, in, in, bats, uh, in the cave systems in Europe. And for some reason, it doesn't affect negatively the bats that are hibernating in those caves in Europe even though it affects our bats here. And so we're trying to figure out in Europe, are those bats, do they, have they developed an immunity system? Uh, or is the fungus not as potent? Uh, they're trying to figure all that stuff out, but science just sometimes is not fast enough to figure these answers out as quick as, as managers need the information to start managing the, uh, the uh, situation. So what would bats that are in the cage or those that are not yeah, so it's, uh, the question is, is it only impacting bats that are in caves? And yes, that's, it's only the, the, the cave or mine dwelling hibernating bats. So if, if, like the, the three residents, uh, I'm sorry, the three migratory bat species we talked about, those bats are not affected because they're not hibernating in those cave systems or those mine systems. So 
It is only if you're a hibernating bat, you're hibernating for the winter. So it's mostly, you know, there is bats that are up in the northern part of the, of the uh, country, more or less. But what the concern is, is as this starts spreading south and west, that uh, if it gets down to the southwestern part of the United States, even though we don't have hibernating bats down there, can they transfer that disease to non-hibernating bats? And, and typically, if the bat wakes up from hibernation and can get out of that cave system, then they're okay for the next, you know, for the active part of their of their year. But if they go back into that cave system and they get uh, white nose syndrome, can they make it through that hibernator, hibernatory period or not? That's a big question. Yeah. Um, this is the fungus that's affecting the bat. There's no bacteria or virus, 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 virus. No, it's strictly a fungus. And uh, from the time the you know, say. Yep, infection. Or, yep. Until it dies, um, it, it, it's uh, it's going to depend a little bit. So, so the time frame of this, so a bat can go into a cave system healthy. So they'll go into the cave system, let's say in October, healthy, and they may get infected and they may not make it out of the cave system at the end of that hibernatory period. How long a period it takes to kill that bat? I think depends a little bit on uh, the amount of the, 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 the uh, quantity of the fungus, for example. Uh, it depends a little bit on how healthy that bat is going into the hibernatory period um, and how much bat reserve it has on there and things like that. There, uh, apparently, there have been some bats that have uh, been attacked by a, you know, a bit of a white nose syndrome, but have been able, they get attacked so late in the year that they've been able to get out of that cave system and they're, they're okay before the fungus really starts to work on the bat. So um, it, it, even though you have high mortality rates and have had high mortality rates out east, that uh, for example, in this cave system right here, where they found white nose syndrome, it did attack all the bats. And so it, it really is it's probably pretty variable. What did you say the uh, lifespan was, and is that pretty much the same for all the species? Yeah, they're pretty long-lived animals. So, you know, it, it, the, uh, like northern long-eared bat, for example, can live 19 years, 19, 20 years, something like that. So all of them can live, uh, if they're given the chance, can live to, to be a pretty old age for a bat. Are the bats in northern Illinois similar to the bats in the Bacchus? For the most part, yep. For the most part, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Makokita caves down here. They close the, it's in a park down there. Yeah. They close that down like a couple of three years. Yeah. Uh, for the people to go in there. Okay. Yeah, but now uh, it's my understanding it's open again. Does okay. that mean that the, the cave cleared itself with this fungus? Um, it was that. Did that cave have witness in the it for, yes, for a fact? That's my understanding. Okay. Right yeah. Um, I don't know why they would close it, then, but why they reopen it then? Um, for that, and I'm because typically they're, they're looking at ways to, to rid caves of the white nose syndrome, but so far they haven't found anything. And the cave ecosystem is it's pretty delicate, and so the concern is if you go in there and you start meddling, you might make it even worse than it is already, even though the white nose syndrome is in there. So, and, and then th there's some issues where they have closed off caves, but then when they put they'll put gates up so people can't get into the cave. But then that changes the airflow of the cave. And so that then affects the humidity, for example, or maybe it increases the airflow, and the bats don't like the, you know, strong air currents coming through the cave. So maybe there was something that, that affected the cave ecosystem that caused them to take the gates down. So I'm not exactly sure about that specific cave, why they did that. Did the caves ever clear themselves up? I'm not aware that they, that, of that yet, and that, but they're still studying that. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't appear to affect humans. Though. Not yet. No, and hopefully it won't. But hopefully it won't. Let's see. I, yeah, I'll come back to you in just a second. Yeah, a lot of times they'll go back to the same cave. Yep, they sure will. And so they're, you know, they kind of will go into these big roosting areas, and they'll just kind of follow each other as they go in there. And then, you know, one of the things you do if you want to. Um, start a bat house, for example, you don't have bats there, is put uh, bat feces or bat guano in the bat house, and then they'll, they'll, uh, that keys them into that area. And so one of the things in these caves, there's just um, giant amounts of guano, as you can imagine, on the floor. And so it's a big you know, signal to come into this cave. Yeah? 
No, so that's a, and was it during the winter or during the summer? Uh, all I know is he and his wife would stand outside and count the basket. Yeah. And you kind of get that. Yep. Yep. So if they, if they were watching them, so that was during the active period, so it was during the warmer months. And so, uh, but so some of these species will uh, go into these large maternal roosts. So when they're actually having pups, sometimes you can get hundreds and thousands of bats in a, in a maternal roost where they're all taking care of these pups uh, kind of uh, communally. Yeah, so it might have been a maternal roost in that in their attic as well. So, and in some, you know, older uh, barns and, and houses that have settled, the bats only need about five-eighths of an inch of a gap to get in someplace. And so it can really be hard in houses or buildings that have settled, you've got so many gaps to keep them actually out of the building. Yeah. How are bats born? How are they born? They're live born. Is a live live birth. Like babies. Yep. So they're mammals. So it's a live birth, and they're you know, warm blooded. They're nursed. Yep. They're nursed. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And I'll talk more about the reproductions. We're actually really pretty cool. In just a second. Yeah. Go ahead. Buddy. No, I just I, I'm just going to check the time to make sure I'm not getting as distracted here. Go on. Well, they'll, they'll typically go, uh, some species will go back into a cave or a mine system for the summer to, to roost. Sometimes uh, they might go into a building, uh, like for example, the big brown bat might go to the building. Sometimes they'll go uh, into trees that have very uh, deep bark crevices and they'll, they'll uh, go there. Sometimes they'll go up into the tree and, and roost up that way. So, yeah, it, it can vary depending on the species. They go back every year. What's that? They go back. I got a house in Hayward. They come back every year to the same place. Yeah, so he said they've got a house in Hayward. You have a house in Hayward. Yeah. And they come back to the same place. And yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yep. And so the, the, you know, the, uh, the exact same bat, you know, so, so bat Joe Smith might not be back to your exact house, but they come back to that general area for sure. There's no doubt. And, and Joe Smith might be back to your house. You know, bat Joe Smith might be back to your house as well. So. That's right. Okay, so so you can just, uh, and if you want to follow this along, if you just Google white nose syndrome, you can see this, and this map will get updated because uh, they're in the, uh, the, the uh, DNR of, across the country are in caves right now and have been through the winter monitoring for white nose syndrome. So now we're starting to get out of the hibernatory period, and this map will get updated here probably by, by summer. It'll be updated. So hopefully um, you can see here, uh, they found it here again. Hopefully, it's not going to start spreading. The, the, the uh, good and bad news about it being found in Grant County is, is, I guess, sort of the good news is you're in a remote corner of the state, so it's going to take a while to radiate out across the state. The bad news is that there's a, a really extensive cave system down here in Grant County, and there's a lot of bats down here. And so, since it's here, it, it probably is going to spread pretty quickly through the county and through the, uh, that other uh, cave system. But nobody knows about that. That's kind of what everybody's watching is how fast this spreads, not only in Wisconsin, but across the country. Okay, so that's kind of the background. So now we're going to talk strictly about the long-eared bat, the northern long-eared bat, okay? And um, this bat, as I mentioned, is uh, being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And the reason is because out east, 99%, as I mentioned, about 99% of the population has decimated, been decimated by white nose syndrome. And so the endangered, or I'm sorry, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service is, is closely watching this. And as you can see, this is the range of the northern long eared bat. And that bat range completely overlaps where the white nose syndrome is. So this bat is, is especially susceptible, or seems to be especially susceptible to white nose syndrome, partly because, uh, for whatever reason, it seems to be susceptible but also because its range overlaps where, where, where uh, white nose syndrome is and where it seems to be spreading. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service is, is uh, starting to take a very careful look at um, the long-eared bat in particular because of that. So here's, the, here's what white nose syndrome looks like. And you can see, as I mentioned, it looks like somebody just took a bat and, and just you know, dipped its face in, in powdered sugar. That's kind of what it looks like. If you have um, if you have bats in your in your attic, for example, 
Uh, it, it is recommended that you, you look and see if you can, if uh, bats have this kind of a, a, a pattern on their face. Um, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any accounts where uh, bats have been found with white nose syndrome uh, uh, hibernating in people's attics and things like that. It seems to be strictly uh, isolated to cave and mine systems right now. But you should still keep an eye on this if you've got bats uh, that you can observe and just let the, uh, somebody in, in your state DNR know or Fish and Wildlife Service know, and they'll come out and take a look at this. And again, it's, uh, it's strictly during the winter time. If, once the bats are out and active, it would be really, really unusual to see this on that bat, okay? So it's strictly during the winter time that you're, uh, you want to be most observant about it. But this is what it looks like, and as I mentioned, we'll get out on the wings here, and it starts eating holes through the wing membrane, and, and then uh, that is more or less doomed the bat once that occurs. All right, so a little, uh, just a little bit of an ecology about the long-eared bat. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the genus is Myotis, which means mouse ear. Kind of, I guess that's a little bit like a mouse ear. And uh, northern long-eared bats seem to be most confused with little brown bats right here. Uh, even, even though little brown bats, uh, their pelage is a little bit darker than here. But, and I hate to show this picture because it makes this bat look mean. And these bats are not necessarily mean. So I, I don't want to uh, give the wrong impression here. But this is one of the best pictures I can find to kind of demonstrate some of the things I wanted to point out. So one thing about the northern long-eared bat is compared to, and again, this is, these are the two bats you're going you're gonna to confuse most commonly. So compared to the little brown bat, the northern long-eared bat, the face is much more pink, for example. Um, and one thing you're going to look at on the ear is the northern long ear, so it's a, it's a long ear. But if you just look at one bat and you see a long ear, there's no, there's no context to that. So you know, everything's relative. So what you're looking at is this a little piece of skin called the tragus. And as you can see, it's this, this uh, triangular piece right here. So the tragus on the little brown, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, on the long eared bat is much thinner and taller than it is on the little brown bat. And on the little brown bat, that tragus also now tends to lean forward a little bit. Okay? So this is a little bit like uh, telling you, well, uh, it, it, it might be a venomous snake. You need to get close enough to that snake to see if it's got an elliptical eye or a round eye. Okay? <laughs> But, but that's kind of what you're looking for. And you might want to get binoculars out, or if the animal is hibernating, obviously, or roosting, uh, it'll be easy to come up and see that because the animal's not moving at that particular time. But uh, those are the couple of, of characteristics you're looking for to see, determine if you've got long-eared bats on your property or, or near you. Um, so long-eared bats, again, uh, they're in the Myotis genus. They're hibernatory. They're one of our resident bats. So they'll come into cave systems here. Uh, this is an example of a cave or a mine system right there. Uh, they will, they have been known to roost uh, or, or hibernate in people's attics, but it is not nearly as common or frequent as, for example, the big brown bat, uh, or less common as the little brown bat. So primarily, these bats are in caves and mine systems, and that's another reason they're susceptible, because they're going into these areas where the white nose syndrome, uh, or the, excuse me, that fungus could be found. And then once they come out of the uh, hibernated, hibernatory period, then they uh, kind of hang out in trees. So they'll hang out in snags, these dead trees. They'll use these cavities right here. Um, this is a, a hickory, so they'll hang out underneath this bark or within that bark system there. Um, and then they also go into rock crevices. Uh, so typically, you find them uh, singularly or in small numbers. They don't get into these large maternal roost colonies like some of the other bat species do. Um, and so you'll usually find them in, in kind of single numbers and things like this. And a couple other things is, as, as with all bats, they are almost strictly insectivores, the bats that we have up here. Uh, and the, although they do get a lot of hydration from the insects, they also will drink water uh, off the pond or off of the landscape as well. So water is kind of an important part. Um, this is kind of a, a cool little thing about bats, and I'm, I'll use the long-eared bat as, as an example of this. But what happens, uh, is that when they start congregating around these hibernaculum, these, these areas where they hibernate, that the males will find the females and the, the males will breed the female in the fall. And then she will have delayed uh, implantation or delayed fertilization. So she will get bred by the male and then she'll go into the hibernation. And then when she comes out of hibernation, 
then she will, uh, actually the sperm will then fertilize the egg, and then come May, you'll start having the pups, and usually they have maybe one or two pups. So even though she gets bred in the fall, nothing happens until the spring. And so it's kind of, that's kind of an interesting thing about bass, and that's one of their reproductive strategies. And as I mentioned, they're long-lived. Um, and so this bat here, this long-eared bat, they might have one, and then at the very, very most, they have two pups a year. And so that's not a very quick rate to kind of, uh, if you, if, to try to combat the amount of mortality that's occurring to these animals. Um, all right, so here's where it gets a little bit interesting. Um, again, because of the decimation to the population of long-eared bats, the Endangered Species Act, uh, excuse me, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is considering listing this bat as an, a, a, on the Endangered Species Act. And so they've got four different decisions, essentially, they could make. They could list it as an endangered species, and endangered means that within uh, most or all of that animal's range, the animal is in, uh, in danger of going extinct. Okay, so that's endangered. They could list the animal's threatened, which means that within all or most of the animal's range, uh, it, it's, it's a threatened species, and they want to keep uh, tabs on it so it doesn't go from threatened to endangered status. They could list it as uh, threatened under the 4D rule, which I'll talk more about in just a minute, or they could not list it at all. Okay, so those are the four choices the, uh, the official health service is looking at right now. So there's this thing under the Endangered Species Act, and, and depending on who you are and, and uh, what you own, land uh, in particular, some people are very, very concerned about the Endangered Species Act because of some of the legal uh, limitations and, and the legal framework under which it, uh, the, the, the government and the federal law of the Endangered Species Act can dictate to you as a landowner what you can and can't do on your property, okay? So a lot of people get nervous when we start talking about the Endangered Species Act. But there's this rule, the 4D rule, it's called 4D, that is the section within the Endangered Species Act that's found. And under the 4D rule, uh, the, the, essentially what this allows the Fish and Wildlife Service to do is to have a, the maximum amount of flexibility in not only protecting the animal that it's trying to protect under the Endangered Species Act, but not unduly burdening people, okay? So it, it, it allows a lot of flexibility under the Endangered Species Act. It does, however, apply only to threatened species. So if the, if the Fish and Wildlife Service comes out April 2nd and says, we are gonna list the Northern Long-Eared Bat as endangered, the 4D rule is no longer applicable, okay? It's not on the table for negotiation or discussion any longer. So it's only if they come out as listed the bat as threatened, and then possibly if they wanted to, they could invoke the 4D rule at that point, okay? But one of the things that gets people so concerned about the Endangered Species Act is this, uh, this section in the Endangered Species Act called where they're talking about take, okay? And, and the idea about the, behind the Endangered Species Act, I think, I think there's a lot of very, very good things about this federal legislation. And it was a groundwater piece of legislation back in 1973, without a doubt. It was, it was a phenomenal piece of legislation. Very for, uh, you know, very, very for th uh, thinking and uh, things like that. Um, but what happens sometimes is the Endangered Species Act, from my, my uh, personal opinion, is the Endangered Species Act uh, for a long period of time was a bit of a band-aid approach. It looks simply at that single species. It doesn't look at the ecosystem, for example. But what the Endangered Species Act tries to do is protect the habitat that th that particular endangered or threatened species needs to survive. And when you start getting into the habitat, this is where uh, the, the term take gets very uh, convoluted a little bit. It gets a little, little uh, gray for a lot of people. So take could mean uh, and, and the Endangered Species Act, for the most part, it, it prohibits the take of an endangered or threatened species at the federal level, okay? And take could mean you cannot harvest that animal. You cannot legally take that animal and, and kill that animal, okay? So that's a, that's a pretty obvious definition of take. Take could also mean, however, and does mean under the Endangered Species Act, that you cannot do something with the habitat that is supporting that animal and do something to modify the habitat in a negative way that will then cause that animal not to be able to survive there in a, in a sustainable period of time. And that's what gets a lot of people very nervous because of that, that this, the habitat issue within the definition of take, okay? So the 4D rule, what they're trying to do is to, tr they're trying to introduce some flexibility with that take, uh, the, the, the definition of take. And so for example, if, if the Fish and Wildlife Service comes out and says the Northern Long-Eared Bat 
we're going to list it as threatened under the 4D rule. It will exempt take from force management practices, for example. So if you want to do timber stand improvement, most likely you're going to be exempt from that. So if, if for some reason you've got long eared bats in your property and something happens to that long eared bat, you will not be held accountable for that under timber stand improvement, for example, because you're exempt under the 4D rule. Okay, as long as you're not doing something intentional to kill that bat or you're doing something egregious. All right? It would, for example, uh, exempt take if you want to uh, clear your prairie of woody vegetation. It would exempt take limited tree removal. For example, if you've got a uh, if you have a, uh, a dangerous tree that you need taken down, you would not you would not come under the uh, the Endangered Species Act. If you've got uh, bats in your house, long-eared bats that need to be removed from a building, uh, it would exempt take from that. Okay, so there's some flexibility here within this 4D rule. So that's a good thing. Uh, and what's really interesting to me about this is that most of the uh, species that are in the Endangered Species Act are there primarily because of habitat loss or we've modified their habitat in some negative way. This is a bit of an interesting case here because they're not talking about listing the northern long-eared bat because of habitat loss. They're listing it simply because of the disease of white nose syndrome. So they're not saying that they're not saying the habitat is in danger. There's nothing wrong with the habitat. And that's why they, they would allow forest management practices. Because there's, there's more than ample habitat out there to support the bat. It's the disease that is the, the primary cause of either endangerment or threatened status, depending on how the, the Fish and Wildlife Service decides to list the animal, if they do decide to list the animal. All right, so here's just a little bit of a timeline for you. Uh, in October 2013, the Fish and Wildlife Service first proposed to list the northern long-eared bat as endangered. And if they, if they were to go through with that, again, that 4D rule would not apply, because 4D rule is not applicable to endangered species. It's only applicable to threatened species. Um, then they opened in January of this year, they opened a public comment period, and that comment period is open until this Tuesday. So if you want to, if you've not already done so, and you want to make a public comment, I, I didn't list how to do that here because it, it would take up three slides about how to do that. But what I would recommend you do is just Google Northern Long Eared Bat Public Comment, and, and probably the first link will come up about how to do that. And the Fish and Wildlife Service, again, until, until the end of Tuesday, they're accepting comments. So if you want to make a public comment, you can do so either written or electronic, okay? And what they're asking is, uh, they're asking for things about how, if they listen to this animal, how would it impact you as a landowner, for example, or how would it impact you as a person? Um, they're also asking for information about the long-eared bat. So if you have uh, information that you could share that would help the Fish and Wildlife Service manage the species, um, please share that as well, okay? And then a final decision, again, is expected on April 2nd of this year. So in, in less than a month, they're going to have a final decision here, supposedly. Now, things uh, don't always work uh, as they're supposed to along that timeline, so it would surprise me if they don't have the federal decision by April 2nd. But, but sometime this year, they should have a federal decision for sure. And again, the four choices are they're looking at endangered status, threatened status, threatened under the 4 rule, or not listing the bat at all. And I'm guessing, I don't, I don't know what they're gonna do, but I'm guessing that not listing the bat is, is probably a, a pretty uh, slim probability because of the decimation to the bat population. So it's gonna be threatened under 4D, threatened or endangered is what's actually gonna happen. So uh, keep your eye open for that. Okay, so um, any questions about this? Um, so this just applies to the northern, um a long-eared bat, if not like the big brown that all Nope, it's just right now, that they're only looking at the northern long-eared bat right now. Yep. Now, there, as I mentioned, uh, and I'm not familiar with, for example, Illinois or Iowa or Minnesota or Michigan, but I do know in Wisconsin that the bats also have protection under our state uh, regulations and state laws. And so that could be that certain bat species could receive state protection even though they don't have federal protection. And this, other than the Indiana bat, this will be the next bat that gets federal protection if it actually does get listed. So she, she just asked about the, she's not familiar with the caves in Grand County. And I'm not from here either, so I'm not too terribly familiar. Anybody from this area who could tell you, well, you seem to know. Yep. So, so they're in the bluffs of the Mississippi yep. River. And, in the valleys. Yep. Uh, rock outcropping. Yep. Yep. So all that area. I mean, I, I think all the, the, the geology. 
the geology of this area kind of lends itself to, yeah, that, that cave system for sure. Cave of the Mountains? Yeah, Cave of the Mountains is up by, well, that's up by where I am, up in Blue Mound. You know, that, if you go down, um, if you go up by uh, Horicon Marsh, Nita Mine is a big one, and that actually is the largest bat hibernacular in the upper Midwest. And, you know, that, that supports hundreds of thousands of bats. In the so that, they're, they're obviously keeping a very close eye on Nita Mine because of that. Yeah? Bats hang out. What kind of bats hang out under the bridges? It's, it's most likely one of the resident bass species we have. So, and most likely probably either the brown or little brown bat, big brown or little brown bat, because they are, uh, although all seven of the bass species can be associated with urban suburban landscapes, uh, it, it typically it seems like the big brown bat and little brown bat are the ones that are mostly associated with that urban suburban landscape, although it could be. The long-eared bat could be the eastern pepper as well. So um, look at the tragus. Remember the tragus? Yeah. So, but the, 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 and the, so, the, and some of the myota species, like the little brown bat, a big brown bat, and the long ears are all the myota genus. Those myota bats sometimes are hard to tell the difference between them. Uh, and sometimes you have to actually look at the dentition of the bat, uh, the, the teeth. So it, it, it might be difficult to tell necessarily about that spe uh, species, depending on what the species is. The scare of uh, rabies, is that overstated? Is that a bigger, uh, kind of yeah, so the he was just asking the scare of rabies, is that overstated? Um, so, so bats, uh, as wonderful as they are, they can gets you sick. And, and so if you are cleaning out an attic and there's a lot of back bottle, for example, you should wear a, at least some kind of respiratory mask uh, because there, as you clean out their feces, um, the, the histoplasmosis can get in your lung and make you sick, for example. I there's value to that. There's value to guano. As a, there's definitely value to guano as a soil additive or, or, or a, a, you know, as, a, as a, a, a material to help grow things. But you don't want to be in an enclosed space with a mound of guano because it will get in your lungs and that can make you sick. So you want to be careful about that. Uh, but back to your question about rabies. Uh, in Wisconsin, the two most common carriers of rabies and transmi trans uh, transmitters of rabies amongst the wildlife community are striped skunks and bats. So it depends on what the year, who's one and who's two. Um, but yes, bats can carry rabies. It's not as if, you know, I think the, I think the uh, Transmission incidence rate is, or, or the, I'm sorry, the infection rate, I think it's like 2% of all bats that are active, so it's not terribly high, but, you know, bats are nocturnal, and so if you, if you see a bat out during the day, um, maybe just be aware of that. If, it's, if it seems like it's not acting normal, uh, be aware of that. You know, we want to be a little careful about that. Um, the Center for Disease Control, and I don't know if this is, that they're just being extra cautious because of how litigious we are in the United States. Um, and doctors are, are, are seem to be um, doctors seem to kind of have a, an aversion to lawsuits in general. But the Center for Disease Control says if you found a bat in the residential part of your house while you were sleeping, you should kill that bat and have it submitted to the county health department for rabies testing. Because apparently uh, there was a child who contracted rabies, and even though they couldn't find a bite or scratch mark on that animal. There was a bat in the room with that with that child that day. Or I'm sorry, they couldn't find a bat or scratch mark on the child, not the animal. On the child, uh, there was a bat in the room with that child when she woke up, that, or when he or she woke up. And so uh, the CDC is extra cautious about that. And they say anytime you've got a bat within the residential quarters where you're living, that especially if you've been sleeping, you should have that bat submitted. Well, so here's the, here's the curious thing. He just said, what if they're protected? So in the state of Wisconsin, for our, our resident bat species, so if you found big brown bats in your house, uh, the, the law allows you to kill five bats a day if you need to. And if you need to, it, well, and so here's what, the, here's what the issue is, and that's why, for example, uh, under the 4D rule, take is exempt from a long-eared bat if they, if they actually classify the bat as threatened under the 4D rule. Take is classified uh, or is exempt because now all of a sudden, it becomes a health, uh, human health concern, and that's what the issue. That's what it, now all of a sudden you've got more flexibility under the law, or a lot more latitude under the law. And so in Wisconsin, at least, if you have bats in your in your dwelling, you can kill up to five every within a 24-hour period 
You're supposed to alert the DNR that you've done that, and you can get a permit to kill more than that if you need to. But think about um, think about if you if you have a bat colony in your house, and let's say that bat colony is rabid, you need to get them out of there, and you need to protect yourself and your family, as well as you know you want to remove those rabid bats from the population so they don't spread it to other bats as well and other animals. So uh, I have them in here in the garage. I tell the kids I'll show them. Okay. Yep. So, I mean, yep. Yeah, so he was just saying, I don't know if everybody can hear him, but he said he's got bats in, the, in his garage and he just tells the kids don't go in the garage during the summer. And, you know, for the most part, you know, and bats and us can coexist. And even if they're living in our house, we can coexist. But just be smart and if you see a bat that doesn't look well, you know, capture it or alert, alert somebody to capture it and submit it for testing and just you know, find out what's going on. And, and I, I have a, I'm a, a PhD doctor, I'm not an MD doctor. So if there are any concerns at all about your health, by all means, contact your, your family physician immediately and have them advise you as to what to do. And then you can make up your own decisions as to how you want to handle that in consultation with your doctor. All right, would you catch up let it go? Would you put it in the house? Or yeah, I would, I would personally, yeah, I and I've done that. But, uh, but if the bat doesn't look healthy, I will kill the bat, and, and I recommend people to kill the bat and submit it for testing. Yeah. I had a bat in another house last fall. I think we just opened up a whole new round of questions. Yeah. Here. <laughs> the first thing is don't tell your wife. Yeah. The second thing is I kill this like because it was hot on the floor. Yeah. Well, I didn't report it to you. Okay, I'm going to need your name and your address, okay? <laughs> So here's what, here's what happens sometimes in the summer. Uh, for example, like the eastern red bat, that they will carry, uh, and sometimes they can have maybe two or three pups, okay? And they'll carry the pups on, the mom will carry the pups on her. Well, sometimes those pups get to be so heavy that she actually, when she leaves the roost, she drops to the ground because she can't fly with that weight on her. And so sometimes people find these bats on the ground and they think, well, there's something wrong with the bat. But look carefully and see if you see pups attached to the, to the bat. And if so, either leave that bat alone if, if that bat's safe and won't get attacked by a cat or some predator, or get, if you can, you know, wear some heavy gloves. And what's that? Welders gloves. Welders gloves work great if you can. They're not, they don't give you a lot of uh, agility. You know, you might actually crush the dang thing trying to squeeze it. But get some gloves that if the bat does bite or, or claw at you, it's not gonna get through to the skin. And just pick that bat up and move it someplace where it's safe and, and out of view of predators and other things like that. But look and see, do you see pups on there or is that bat really incapable of flying for, for a, a, a health reason or maybe a, you know, its wing got broken or whatever the case might be? Yes, sir. A bat, so not the kids, can't pick up. They can, yes. Yeah, so they can. They, you know, they. Uh, it, takes a while. It, it takes a little bit of time, but they'll just kind of want. You know, they'll just kind of hop along like this, and they can also. You know, what they might do is hop along, and they might crawl over to a tree and then climb that tree and then take off from there. I have another question. Yeah. A weird. Um, weird questions are allowed. Yeah. I'm not even sure what your question is. Well, uh, <laughs> I know there's a question in there somewhere. Uh, the question is the composition of bad milk, which brings in fat protein and Oh, I see. You mean passing that on to the, to the pup. Yeah, but if they have. Yeah. I don't know what the content is, but I'm guessing it's, it's like any other mammal who is nursing, that, that, that they're passing on uh, immunity to the young. They, you know, it's very high. Uh, Caloric content to, to get that young to grow very quickly. I'm not even going to ask how you know this, but I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> so I'm trying to learn about that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know what? If you want to look at that, I would look at, at some physiology textbooks. And, and there, you'll probably find some information on that. Do you have any kind of patterns for making bat boxes? Yeah, so um, let, me, uh, let me 
go here quickly. If you go to this, is Bat Conservation International. It's a, a phenomenal advocacy group, a conservation group dedicated to bats. Um, it's based in Austin, Texas. But if you go to batcon.org, they have got excellent bat house plans on there. And they'll tell you how to construct it, they'll tell you how to place it, uh, where to place it, where not to place it, things like that. And so batcon.org or Bat Conservation International, if you just Google it, that should come right up. And then the other thing, since we're here, I'll just point out, this is a website that I've developed in uh, collaboration with a couple of colleagues of mine at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and the United States Department of Agriculture and Wildlife Services. And uh, this is primarily dedicated to wildlife damage, and we do have a fact sheet on bats here. And, and part of that fact sheet, we talk about uh, the, the history of the bat, uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, the ecology of bats, some of the life history of them. We do have uh, pictures and, and identifying marks on those uh, the eight bats that uh, at one time called Wisconsin home. And then we talk a lot about if you've got a bat in your, in your attic or if you've got problems with bats, here are some uh, ways to manage the damage situation to uh, avoid further problems. So you can look at that as well. Uh, yeah? I mean, this is, so if a bat gets the fungus, it's, it's, it's going to be taste off eventually. Uh, most likely. Yeah, most likely. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, what? The resident bats? Did you say do, do the, oh, I'm sorry, the long-eared bats? Yeah, yeah, they will. Yep, they, they will. Uh, maybe not as much as, for example, uh, like the big brown or little brown bat, that, because those bats are more uh, communal. And the uh, long-eared bat is more of a singular. You know, they don't they don't hang out in large numbers so much. So and and they really are much more of uh, the long-eared bat likes crevices. Uh, you know, inside the bark of trees or crevices in rocks or something like that. So that's kind of where you typically find them. And again, they're much more singular than uh, some of the other bat species. So bat houses are phenomenal put up, and and they're they're great additional provisional habitat. Um, but not every bat species will always use them. Let me go there, since I don't think you've asked a question before, and then I'll come back to you. How do bats use Primarily for the summer. They don't provide enough thermal cover, uh, especially up this far north, where the, the animals will hibernate in the bat box. But they'll use them for summer for uh, daytime roosting, for example. Um, that, there, and then I'll come back this way. The percentage of the different types of bats around here. All right, so the big brown bat, the percentage is 17.3. And the little brown bat is 39.2. So I don't, I'm not sure what it is. I'm just making that up. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know for sure that. And see, that's, the, that's part of the problem, is uh, not only in Wisconsin, but across the country, we really don't know how many, for example, big brown bats there are, or how many eastern red bats there are. Because uh, and, and so we, uh, you know, we, we haven't really studied these animals that much until all of a sudden white nose syndrome has come on, and now there's a lot of interest in that. There's a lot of money flowing to the research on, on that, and so now there's a lot more light being shed on bats. So prior to that, you know, we we didn't know how many bats. We still don't know how many bat uh, bats per species are, even within a, a rough population estimate, for example. We don't know. Um, we don't know. Uh, Typically, sex ratios are about male and female, for example, on some of these species. We don't know how to build a population structure on these species. And so there's a lot of demography that we don't know about, which is kind of hindering some of the management here because we're not so sure about, you know, do we have a lot of adults or do we have a lot of younger cats uh, that are going to replace these adults and, and things of that nature. So, Why has this never been researched? Uh, well, because you only research things where you get money for them. And typically, bats have not been high on the list of, of, uh, of research, pri research priorities. And they are now simply because of white nose syndrome. Let's see, here in the... Um, so we're going to use the bat house. We're going to see different sizes. Yeah. Um, so what size is the bat house? Um, what size would you recommend? And also, would it be a good idea to have maybe a one? Or does it matter? Yeah, it can, you know, it, it, it depends on what's around. So sometimes, Bats won't use bat houses because there's so much good habitat around that they don't need to come to the bat house. Um, so if you don't have a lot of good you know, roosting areas, the more bat houses, the better. Sometimes you can build these great big, what they call chimney bat houses. You know, it's a, it's a 
relatively large structure, you know, maybe from the floor up to there, and it might be, you know, from, I don't know, from, from me to that, not quite me to that wall, but, you know, it's a pretty big structure. So you can build something like that. You can build individual bat houses. You can buy them if you want to. Um, and so I would look around and see, you know, do a little bit of research and figure out what bat species you might have in your area, figure out what habitat they require, and then find out as you start looking around, is there a lot of habitat around here for them, especially roosting habitat? Because that bat box is, is actually providing, that is provide that roosting habitat. All right, so let me, uh, let me just hold on for one second. It's 11.45. Um, I, I think I'm standing between you and lunch. No, no, no. no a break. A break. A break. Yeah. Uh, so still, I'm, I'm happy to stay here and, and keep answering questions and talk about this as much as you want. But if you need to go or you want to go, please uh, feel free to get up and go. Okay? Thank you very much.